I also uh, picked up a cold, it sounds like, so uh, I'm croaking slightly. But uh, let me know if you can't hear me, and I'll, I'll try and put out some more power. <coughs> One group of students realized last night that the that Lab 3 as written had a pin overlap, the pin 25 was used both for the VREF output, and that is not on PPS, so you cannot remap it, overlapped the uh, S-Clock 1, which is also not on PPS, so that the TFT display could not be run simultaneously as written with the VREF. And to me, very nicely, last night, hacked his driver so that the driver now works on SPI channel 2 or on SPI channel 1. The only thing you have to do to make the SPI work on the TFT display work on SPI channel 2 is to download the new TFT master file which is linked in lab 3 and move the clock wire from pin 25 to pin 26. So, a tiny amount of work, which is nice. One of the students produced a very nice image of the microstick this is a this is not the full image this is just a uh, a thumbnail that i put in line in, on the web page <coughs> the full pdf has uh, a, a lots of information you might want to look at it it's handy i've been using it But mostly I want to show you that I hacked lab three a little bit so that the TFT master two, uh, master SPI two dot C file is linked up here. There is a zip file here which uses protothreads 1.2 the SPI2 master and changes the analog input to AN11 because I had written originally the analog stuff for AN9 which uses pin 26 so AN11 is pin uh, 24 so I believe that this is all consistent now with lab three and I decided that I'd put a picture of the potentiometer these are called trim pots because they're meant to be to trim a resistance with a screwdriver but we're using them as as a human interface device the trim pot the bottom view and the schematic so there could be no doubt at all how the pinout maps to the various uh, three pins on the on this schematic over here. <clears throat> so a few modifications, no real change. One wire has to be moved. Any questions on this? Any questions on lab three right now? Given that you're going to have to compare the positions of every ball with every other ball, so it's n times n minus 1 over 2 compares on every time step. It seems like doing the comparisons in an efficient fashion is a good idea. And so you should think a little bit about the minimum arithmetic you have to do to show that two balls cannot possibly interact. Because once you do that, you throw away that pair and you don't have to do any further calculation. Are there any, 
again, any questions on lab three? Anybody got the ball, billiard ball dynamics working yet? It's early. <clears throat> I also played with the Proto Threads um, library a little bit. Always a dangerous thing to do in the middle of the semester, but what the heck. And so there's now a version 1.2. The only difference between 1.2 and 1.1 is that 1.2 fixes a feature that was broken in 1.0, 1.1, that being that the threader could not yield a thread from inside a case statement. That became an issue in lab two, so it, but it is now fixed as long as you use, as long as you use the 1.2 version. <clears throat> and to, to show that, I wrote a small example which uh, takes keyboard commands, that is to say from the, from the PC keyboard, and then uh, does various uh, operations in a case statement. That's not too relevant for lab three, but it will be very relevant for lab four, where you're going to want to, where you're required to have a keyboard interface from the PC to the, to the uh, microcontroller. Again, any questions about lab three at this point? You just mentioned that we have to find the arithmetic, uh, minimum arithmetic to find the distance between two balls. And in the, uh, in the uh, algorithm you give in this page, uh, it says that we have to uh, calculate uh, to multiply and one adding to get the distance. So I'm thinking uh, it's the, the distance is calculated from the coordinate coordinates. So actually we can find the first find the x coordinate distance. If it's uh, less than one value of them we can tell the y uh, axis distance and uh, that we don't have to calculate multiply. That That's right. right. That's a good idea. Uh, if you if you do the compares for the distances in fixed point coordinates so that all you have to do is uh, subtract for the for the x dimension and subtract for the y dimension then if either of the principal directions is greater than two units or three units or whatever you choose for the radius then you know it can't possibly hit you throw it away and that does and then then if it passes the crude test then you calculate the sum of the squares and find out if it's Actual, an actual impact. This also, uh, the, the, you can also at that stage, uh, that also bounds the square operator so that you won't get overflow. So you get, it's a two for one. It's faster to do the Manhattan distances and, it's, uh, and it also bounds the, uh, the, the distance that you calculate for the sums of squares. So that's a good thing to do, yes. So for the, uh, for the sounds in DMA, would it, would it work if we had like, the DMA threads running and just say you had one memory for three different DMA threads and you had early in each thread you had some kind of null character that caused it to then when you wanted to play the sound, you, you write to that null character something else, so it, it goes beyond it and it plays the sound that's hidden behind it. Is that something that Oh, I see. So you're saying, is it possible to start all, D, all three DMA threads running but have them make no sound? Yeah, so you just have... It's not, it's not clear to me that that uses less CPU time than just enabling the channel. 
which you can do with a single command. You can enable a DMA channel and you can disable the DMA channel. So I don't think you're going to need to do that. You could probably you could probably use in fact just one DMA channel with three arrays and change the source of the DMA for each of the uh, each of the sounds. I heard one group yesterday yucking it up saying, well, we could make some very rude some very rude sound effects here. And I guess I'd like to keep them, the sound effects. Um, I, I think the, 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 the six words you can't say on, on television, isn't that an old uh, Carlin uh, routine? Let's avoid the six words you can't say on television. You can Google that, you can YouTube that up and find out what they are. I bet you can guess at least two of them. Yeah. What else for lab three? I promised to talk some more about DMA and I will. So the DMA hardware, let me reiterate now, DMA is a hardware system that can manipulate memory addresses at the same time that the CPU is manipulating memory addresses. So it's not completely general. There are uh, four or five or six, depending on the exact chip, there's four or five or six bus masters. There's a CPU instruction bus master. There's a CPU data bus master. There is a DMA bus master. That is to say address generator. And there's a debug. And there's some others. There are three targets, three target buses that these guys can talk to. There's flash memory, that is to say program memory. There's data RAM, and there's the peripheral bus. CPU instruction can only issue addresses to RAM or flash. CPU data can issue commands to all three. However, each target can only each target can only take a, a request from one bus master at a time. DMA can request data from all three, and so can the debug. So there's kind of a matrix of possible switches, but if you're mostly mostly reading CPU instructions and mostly DMAing to the peripheral bus, then you can do quite a lot and never and never have a bus contention between the CPU and or seldom have a bus contention between the CPU and <coughs> DMA. So this is separate hardware. The DMA hardware can produce a source address. So you're going to move data from RAM to RAM. It can generate a source address with looping in hardware. This is a hardware loop construct. It can generate a destination address with looping. It can generate a transfer size, total transfer size,
and it can generate a size per trigger event. So for instance, you can ask to take a thousand ADC samples in one DMA burst, but each trigger event will be one sample synchronized with a, a, a timer interrupt. So on each timer interrupt, you get one, you get one sample for a total of a thousand samples. And that can all be done in hardware. Independent of the CPU. Any questions? So, so as an example, if we were going to do uh, ADC to RAM, the source size is two bytes corresponding to a 10-bit number, a number between 0 and 1023. The destination size would be 1,024 word positions times two bytes. So the total transfer size would be 4028 and the size per trigger would be 2. For the case you're going to be using in lab 3, you're going to be setting up a RAM to DAC where this is the VREF DAC. The source size will be whatever the table is that you're going to be outputting. So let's say that you set up a timer to sample at 10,000 samples per second and you need a and you want a tenth of a second, well, you could, you could loop through a table or you could just have one long output sequence, but you're going to need to have something like a thousand or so samples. The destination size is going to be one byte because that's the size of the control register for the I think it's the size of the control register for, for the uh, VREF might be two bytes I'll have to check that and the size per trigger would be one Let me show you a code example of that. With a different DAC, So the first example here is a, uh, is a DMA to 7-bit DAC. And so it's not quite the same DAC, but that's okay. And we're going to
have a sign table in this case that's going to be looped through a bunch of times, which you could do also here. <clears throat> and I should also say that VREF is going to, for, to use the VREF output, you have to concatenate your, your VREF value with a control, a set of control bits for every sample and that has to be built into the table that you output. We'll talk about that in a minute. We're going to, so the, what's going to be done here is to open a, a, a DMA channel in auto mode, which means auto repeat forever until disabled. We're going to set the transfer from a, a, a memory location whose symbol name is sign table, and that's a pointer because it's an array. And then we're going to, the target is going to be one byte, which is the uh, part of the B output register, the lower seven bits, lower eight bits of the B output register. The size is, the, tar the source size is the table size. The destination size is one byte, and the data per transfer is one byte. We're going to set up an event control for this channel, which is to say we're going to start on a timer two interrupt. Yes. So, do we not set the total transfer size? <clears throat> this is the total transfer size. But it's because it's in automatic mode, as soon as it gets done with this many bytes, it'll start over again at the beginning and keep going. So it auto loop in auto mode, it auto loops across the address range for both the source and the destination. So the source auto loops across this size. The destination auto loops one. So it always puts this thing, it puts the data in the same place. And does this indefinitely. So there's no true number of, since it's in auto mode, there's no true total number of transfers. We're going to then set up a timer to time out at a, at a given interval, which will be the sample rate. And we're linking this DMA channel to an interrupt, timer to interrupt, but you do not write an interrupt service routine. The DMA subsystem maintains its own special set of interrupt flags that, it's, that it clears and deals with on its own in hardware. So once you set this up, the CPU does nothing to keep it running. Then the last thing we do is a channel enable, and it's going. It's pushing data out. And because I put this out of channel B, I had to enable some B outputs, and had to build a table up here with that was just the right length because you can't do any arithmetic when you're doing a DMA burst you just have to be spit memory out so I had to make sure the, the, the tables were exactly the correct length for a given frequency so this is not direct digital synthesis I was going for speed here so once you set up this piece of hardware this coprocessor it's a memory coprocessor. Once you set it up, it's autonomously executing. Now, 
Now another possibility, which ProtoThreads uses for the for the DMA uh, UART, is to have a source of unknown size, but which has a specific stop byte value. So you don't know how many bytes you're going to send, but the last byte in a C string is always a zero. That's how, that's how C terminates a string. So you know that no character can have the value hexadecimal zero until you get to the end of the string. The destination size is one because we're going to be spitting this out of a, a UART uh, serial port. So what we're going to do is set up the trigger size to be one but the stop condition will be a pattern match. So where did I put that? Well, let's go to the, actually to the ProtoThreads page and look at the 1.2 version, which is a little cleaner. Down near the bottom is part of the, the thread setup. And there's a big chunk of code here which sets up the, the UART section. And you can see it is protected by an if diff and an end diff so that only if this symbol, use UART serial, is defined, do you actually turn on the port pins. You define a couple of port pins for input and output, for transmit and receive. Do a bunch of UART configure. But the important stuff for this, for this talk, for this uh, piece of the uh, lecture, is that we're then going to open a DMA channel, which is going to spit out a continuous stream of characters until it reaches a null character. Once the first character is loaded into the transmit buffer. So the CPU is going to load the first character into the transmit buffer, enable the DMA, which is then going to run until it reaches a null and stop. So what we need to do then is to open a channel. And we're going to open it with the match option to turn it off. We're going to set the event control to start on an interrupt, end on a match, and also start on interrupt, which is the UART transmit empty interrupt. So when the UART can, re can take another byte to send, it throws an interrupt request saying, give me data. All right, so you load it. In this case, the DMA is going to load it on the interrupt. Then we're going to set the transfer to be from the send buffer plus one. Why plus one? Because we're going to send the first byte manually. So the DMA transfer st starts with the second byte of the string, with the second character of the string. <clears throat> the target is the transmit register, the UART2 transmit register. The length is max cares, <coughs> but it should never get there because you should have a pattern match to stop before then. And the transmit, uh, the, the, packet, the, the, the transaction size is one. <clears throat> and then we're going to, we need to, be able to tell the threader when the DMA transaction is done. So we're going to turn on a event flag, which says that let the set a bit in a register when the block transfer is done. In other words, when you get a match, when you match the zero, set a flag so that the CPU can tell that it's ready that you're done with the DMA burst. And then we set the match pattern to null. So
So the DMA channel is sitting there inactive because it was not enabled. In the transmit code, then, there's a little function, that, a little uh, thread, actually, which is, which is spawned to do the transmit. You first make sure that the foolish user actually put something in the string. And if there's at least one character in the string, then we wait until the transmit, uh, transmitter is ready. That's just to make sure that no other tra no character is finishing transmitting from another thread. <clears throat> we send one byte manually. So we do a PT send buffer zero. That sends the first character. Remember, at 9600 baud, this takes a millisecond. This is forever CPU time. So. <clears throat> We do a send byte, and then immediately enable the DMA channel without waiting for the end of the send. And then we do a yield until the channel block bit is done. So we're going to throw a character out to the, to the uh, UART, turn on the DMA channel, and do a swap out of the thread. So it's not blocking at all. That's all you have to do. Once the DMA is enabled, as soon as this send byte is done sending, the transmit buffer is now empty, and that triggers a DMA burst to reload the buffer. And that goes on until the pattern match, which is the hex zero. Then the whole system turns off because the event and, and signals that the event block is done, in which case we know we can exit the thread because we're done sending. Yes? Is there, yes, you can do this without a thread. I just like to be able to spawn a thread to do this. I thought it was cleaner that way. Oh, um, yeah, I guess I was wondering, so the only reason we do the first byte manually is that we can, like, know, so that it triggers the DMA? So, so you could, there's a couple of ways to do it. One is to, start a DMA burst manually, which you can do, and then immediately, within a millisecond, convert it over to, to respond to the, to the UART empty interrupt. But that's hardly less work than just loading a character by hand. So this synchronously starts the process when you know the data is there, when the user knows the data is there, and then ends when it gets to the end of the string. So this means you only take one context switch, you only take one yield per string, not per character, but per string, because it yields until the string is complete. This is very cool. Any questions? From a C programming perspective, what is the, uh, what's that UART transmitter is ready function? Does that, does that include a semaphore or? The UART, the, the UART is ready is a, uh, is checking a, 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 a flag, a hardware flag, and yielding the thread until the hardware flag is, is clear. Well, it, it yields. It yields to another thread. Huh. 
the, the whole goal here is to make the, all of the, trans, the UR transmit and receive completely non-blocking. Because a millisecond is such a long time. So I tried to be pretty obsessive about making sure that there were no, at no time did you wait a millisecond. Yeah. By sin, I meant <clears throat> like waits, checks it in another P thread, time interval, and then. So what it does is it every time you dispatch the thread in, in main. It does a check to see if it's ready to execute. If it's not, it just throws back out again. Let me. Let me go back and pick up just a little bit on VREF as a digital to analog converter. We'll go down to one of the earlier examples. So this is not DMA driven. If I did that, there'd be nothing left for you to write. So this, is, this particular system is being driven directly off of an interrupt. Is it? No, I'm just, I'm just stepping through this as fast as possible. Let me get you one that's interrupt driven here. If I can, if I can get enough onto my bifocals here to actually see it. Oh, I won't worry about that now. I should have queued it up. So what we have to do to, to turn on the VREF as a voltage source is to do a CREF open. We're going to enable it. We're going to enable its output. So it's now connected to pin 25. As soon as you push this button, it's connected to pin 25. We're going to set the range to low for better linearity. The source is AVDD. And the start value is 0 volts. <clears throat> There's 16 step values. Once you set up the CREF, there is a register CVRCON that you can read back to find out what the setup bits are necessary to run the port. The top, oh, it's going to be a two byte two transfer. The top bits here configure the VREF, the bottom four bits will determine the value that you output, the voltage value that you output. So when you build the table, when you build the table, you're going to have to or together the setup and the value and store those in the table. So you're going to have to take a constant that you get back from CVRCon, which should have this value, <clears throat> or it with the voltage that you want, and store it in the table. Because you can't do or type arithmetic on the fly from a DMA channel. It has to be pre pre or and stored in the table. See if I can find that other example. <clears throat> Can't see it right now. 
my, my color resolution is not very, there it is. I have tried to scroll this screen by pushing it. <laughs> but so far I have not done that this semester. <coughs> So, yeah, okay. So here you can see that there's a sign table. We're getting the, we're, 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 we're doing a phase increment. We're shifting the phase. We're then setting a DAC value, which is directly related to the sign table. So this is direct digital synthesis, but we're oring it with the CVR setup, CVR con setup value each time through the loop because those bits are necessary to run VREF. You cannot do this OR operation on the fly, you have to store it in the table. So you'd be doing this operation and then ORing it down here. With whatever sound you want to make. There is some information above this on how to play a wave file from the 4-bit DAC. Try to avoid copyrighted material. If you're going to if we're going to put it on the web, you should avoid copyrighted material. Try to avoid particularly rude comments. Any questions? <coughs> Probably the way you're going to handle this is that you are going to initialize a DMA channel and do everything except except set the transfer source and enable it. So when you get ready to play a sound you'll set the transfer source to one of three arrays you'll set the transfer source to one of three arrays and you'll enable the channel and it'll blast out the burst. Again, you're going to use the, the 3.5 millimeter connector to take the output of the DAC and connect it to speakers. If you decide to connect to an earphone for testing outside of lab, because you can't take the speakers out of lab, if you decide to test with an earphone, you should probably put about a hundred microfarad capacitor in series with the earphones at the output of the DAC because the DAC has a large DC offset which will mess up uh, uh, certain kinds of speakers like earphones. The desk speakers aren't bothered by that because they have a high pass filter in them that cuts off about 50 Hertz. So any DC and everything below 50 Hertz is gone. Anybody got balls moving on the screen yet? Yeah? Anybody got DMA running yet? It's like this weird programming language that you're going to use to program a piece, separate piece of hardware. Really, you're setting up a, a program. You're setting up a... You're, you're building really it's not even programming, you're, you're building a set of hardware to do an operation in parallel with the CPU. And because you're building this complicated thing, there's a pop.
pile of options. What do you want to hear about next? Do you want to hear more DMA stuff? There, the, the microchip section 31 of the reference manual is the DMA controller and it lists a bazillion features, all of which it says are key features. See, right there at the top it says key features. And <clears throat> so you can you can find out fairly quickly what the system is capable of and it's pretty much what I've said here flexible DMA operating modes flexible data transfer fixed oh you oh yes I haven't even talked about channel arbitration but you probably won't need to worry about that one shot or auto repeat channel to channel chaining I haven't talked about that one DMA channel can trigger another DMA channel automatically. Flexible DMA requests from peripheral inter interrupt sources. Each channel can select any interrupt as its DMA request service. It can also end on any interrupt, which I haven't mentioned. So you can force a, 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 an end on either a pattern match or on any interrupt in the system. Yeah. So, for instance, if you're triggering off of, a, off of a timer, you could say, how many values do I want to transfer on that trigger? Do I want to transfer one value, which is usually what you want to do. But there could be situations in, the, in which you want to put out a small burst. So you can send blocks, you can, you can send subsections of data all at once on each trigger, or you can send individual items up to a block size, which is the entire transfer size. You can also detect various things for control. You get uh, we've block transfer complete, source empty or half empty. Half empty, huh. Destination full or half full. DMA transfer aborted due to an external event. And invalid DMA address. Uh, I don't know much about the invalid address. I'm guessing that that's mostly active in, in, when you're working with a virtual memory system. But I don't know for sure. I copied out an event table because there's plenty to, to stare about here. Uh, you can, these are the, the kind of events that, that will start a transfer, end a transfer, and there are all kinds of ways of starting and ending a transfer. Probably what you're going to do for this lab is you're going to start a transfer manually by enabling the channel and you're going to let it run until the block size is done until the transfer is complete although you could end it on a on a timer interrupt also so I just for now I just put these down here in the on the main page uh, list oh yes and Pick 32 pin out. Here's the full PDF of, of the image generated by the, the hey. student. In glorious color with the peripheral pin select tables for your viewing pleasure. It's actually pretty nice. It's nice to have all in one place.
I'm going to be in lab all afternoon today. And all day tomorrow and the next day, obviously. Any last minute questions? What do you want to hear about next? More of what? Shoot me an email. Okay.